Hello, my fellow TCG and or Disney fans. I am super excited to be talking about new card game that's coming out and the how to play behind it, which is called Lorcana. So this trading card game is all Disney theme. It's all Disney characters, items, things like that. I'm super hyped. I'm a big Disney fan, if you couldn't tell from my Lilo and Stitch shirt. And I'm also a big TCG fan. I've played a big amount of them. Hearthstone, Yu-Gi-Oh, Magic, like... I've either seen them or I've played them or both. And this game so far looks really interesting. We haven't had all the cards revealed yet, but now we have a, a wide breadth of information on how the game works, how a couple keywords work, and things like that. So I felt that we could finally get into a real how to play video and go over kind of everything that the game has to offer. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. Okay, so first up, I want to talk about the different types of cards you're going to be seeing inside of this game. Uh, first and foremost, you have your character cards, which are all of the Disney characters that you know and love, maybe hate, depending on if they're a villain or not. And uh, these characters have their ink cost, they have a strength and a willpower value, as well as a lore value, which we'll get into a little bit more later on. But these are primarily the cards that you'll be using to win the game, challenge your opponent's characters, and have fun interactions like that. Moving on to the next type of card, we have item cards. These are cards that will help you in various different ways, from drawing cards to healing characters, maybe giving a character a rush ability where they can act the first turn they're played. These stay in play until something either removes them or a card says otherwise. And they, so far we've seen things like coconuts and frying pans and a couple of different things like that. And then uh, the next type of card, is uh, kind of like a two-part. They're action cards. There are your regular action cards, which happen once, resolve the effect, and then they are placed into your discard pile. And then there's a second type of action card called Song. So both action cards are very similar in that you play them, they do their effect, and then they kind of go away. The main difference with songs are your characters can actually sing the song for you. So depending on the song, as in one jump ahead, if you have a character that costs two or more, you can turn that character sideways, meaning that it's used its action for the turn, and you can play the song without paying its ink cost, which is pretty interesting. It's a new take on basically paying your spells as they would be in other games. It's songs in Lorcana, and I like the flavor of it. I think they did a really good job with that, and kind of makes it a little bit more dynamic rather than just always having to use your ink to cast cards similar to like a mana in other card games. So as you may have noticed, all these cards have a different colored banner on them. This is referred to as their ink color. There are six colors currently that we've seen. I don't think there's plans on any other colors being introduced anytime soon. But they are Amber, Amethyst, Emerald, Ruby, Sapphire, and Steel. Each one of these kind of has their own theme to go along with it, and each color or ink color stone will kind of have its own pluses and minuses in terms of strengths and weaknesses and it's pretty dynamic for deck building where you will maybe say play ruby which seems to be very fast and like aggressive and then maybe supplement it with like sapphire to maybe get ink a little bit faster or steel to have a little bit more defense and robustness to your deck kind of lets you tailor make your deck the way you want it and allow you to shore up some of those weaknesses between the different colors so as it is right now, decks can only be built with one or two inks. It's just a hard rule in the game. There's no like mana that you can kind of put in there to make it three color or four color. That's hard capped at two, which is pretty interesting in my opinion. It does limit upwards mobility of different colors, but that might be a good thing because in a lot of these games, every so often we'll have a format where all five or six, in this case, colors go together to make one super, ultra, mega, unstoppable pile of cards, and then nobody has fun because they can't play their interesting strategies. So limiting it to two kind of leaves that open a little bit. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out, and I'm looking forward to it. Now, for deck building itself, all decks have to have a minimum of 60 cards. You can have four copies of any one card in your deck, and they do mean card, not character. So you can have two different versions of, say, like a Stitch. Or two different versions of something like a Hades, which comes up later with a ability called Shift. But you're allowed to play them as normal, 
characters are not unique. You can have four different Mickeys on the board, four of the same Mickeys on the board, doesn't matter. So you have a 60 card minimum, four cards of each type, each different named card in your deck. And that's pretty much the only stipulation aside from the ink. Now let's move on to how to actually play Lorcana. Uh, when you set up, you're going to shuffle your deck, present it to your opponent to allow them to cut and randomize your deck as well. You will randomize theirs in turn, return them, draw a hand of seven cards, and before the game begins, you are allowed to take any number of those cards that you don't think are maybe good enough or maybe they're too expensive, put as many as you would like on the bottom of your deck, and then draw that many cards. It's basically referred to as a, a mulligan in most games. In Lorcana, they call it altering your starting hand, which is pretty accurate. That's exactly what you're doing. So you draw a hand that you feel like isn't really that playable. That's okay. You can ship some of those cards back to the bottom of your deck, draw a new hand, then you reshuffle your deck to keep it randomized, and hopefully you have a better starting hand that's a bit more playable for you. You can enjoy playing your game. On your turn... Except for the first turn, you do not draw. You will do a certain set of things. Your beginning phase, you will get ready. Ready all your cards, so if they're tapped sideways, you will ready them and place them base back to ready position to do an action, which is straight vertical. Uh, you will set, look for any effects that happen at the start of your turn, and then you'll draw a card. And like I said, except for the first turn, you don't draw because you get the benefit of playing first. Uh, on your main phase, you can do any action you want in any order you want, unless there's any kind of limitations that the cards tell you otherwise. So you can add a card to your ink, which is you will show a card to your opponent, and as long as in that symbol on the top left corner of cost, you see a little circle icon, that means it can be placed into your ink well as ink, which is what allows you to play your cards. So if it does not have the circle, it's just a regular hexagon, that card cannot be placed face down. I've seen a lot of the more powerful action cards don't have the ability to be played as ink, which is further enhancing your deck building. It's another limitation that you have to consider. You might want to play all these powerful cards, but now maybe you don't have enough ink to actually play them, so you want to make sure you have a good balance of cards that are inkable and non before you get out there and play some games. So after you've added a card to your ink well, you can play a card by paying its ink cost. So if you have something that, say, costs one, you'll take that face-down card, after showing it to your opponent and placing it face down in your inkwell, you will tap it sideways, which is exerting it, and now you have one ink to spend on any of your cards. If your card costs one, you may play it. Obviously, higher costs require more ink to be turned sideways, so it's a progression of turn one, one, turn two, two, turn three, and so on. Or at least that's how you hope <laughs> you draw enough cards that you can put into your ink to be able to play your higher or mid-cost cards. When you play a card from your hand as ink, it is also important to note that ink is not public knowledge outside of you showing the card to your opponent and then placing it into your ink well. So once you take a card and place it face down, you're no longer allowed to check your ink and neither is your opponent. You only reveal it the first time to show them that the card can in fact go into your ink well. After that, it's off limits. So when you play a card like One Jump Ahead, you can take the top card of your deck, place it face down into your inkwell, it becomes ink. You're not allowed to see that card as per the rules of the game. You can't check the top card of your deck at any time. When you play the spell, it doesn't allow you to check it. And once it's in your ink, you're not allowed to touch it. So it's an important ruling to keep in mind. It's not very apparent that you're not allowed to look at it, but you are not allowed to look at yours or your opponent's inkwell. Once the card's face down, it's just ink. It's nothing else. Now you're also able to activate an item, which you can do as soon as the item comes into play, or you may play a character ability that does not require you to exert it. So some characters will have like an on-play effect or a once-per-turn effect that doesn't require them to be turned sideways. And then finally, with a character that has been in play during your set step, which most of the time means it's been there since last turn, so turn one you'll play it, the character's unable to act, and then the next turn you'll be able to type it sideways and either quest, challenge another character, or use an ability that requires you to exert it. So I'll get a little bit more into character cards because they're a little bit more complex and how questing works and basically winning the game works now that you have all of the things you can do. So characters, like in many other card games, um, they do have a turn that they need to get ready to be used. 
In Lorcana, the ink has to dry on the on the character as you've just inked them into existence. You have to wait for them to be ready. So once they're ready, after you've waited your turn, or if somehow a card or effect puts the character into play before your set step, so you get ready, something comes into play, it's there since set, you're good to go, and now you can activate your character's abilities. So uh, of the three, you can challenge, which just means that your character will attack another, you can use an ability, or you can quest. Now, questing is how you win the game. So all characters have a little diamond on the right side of their text box. That is their lore counter. You, the objective of Lorcana is to be the first player to reach 20 lore. Every time you exert a character, let's say the character has one lore pip, you would gain one lore. If they have two, you would gain two, and so on and so forth. So whenever you tap a character and say, hey, I've exerted my character, they're going to go on a quest, you're going to gain that much lore, and it's going to bring you that much closer towards winning the game. Now, the reason why I say the first player is because this game has been built to be a more than two-player game. You can play pretty much as many people as you want, Unlike most other card games where you have like a life pool that hits zero and that's how you lose, you don't have life as a player in Lorcana. You're just racing to 20. So you can play four or five people. And one of the cool things about that is, unlike some other multiplayer formats, you're never really out of the game until it ends. So whoever hits 20 first wins. But all, let's say you play four players, all four of you get to play every turn. Where other games, if you had a life pool, you might lose on turn four, and then you just kind of have to sit there and watch your three other friends play, which is interesting in, in some ways, but can get kind of boring. So you won't really have that issue with Lorcana, and it, it makes it really interesting for me too, is if you have a really strong deck and people team up against you, they can only do so much. They might run out of resources trying to stop you from beating them, and then you may wind up winning anyway, so... It, it's a little bit more dynamic than just simply like, ah, he has no more life. They can't do anything. Now you might get rid of all the player's characters, but then maybe they have a card that brings them back or a card that wipes out all of your characters or does something else wacky and fun. So it's actually really cool to see that. I, I like that they built in with more than two players in mind. It's, it's actually kind of refreshing, and I, I really enjoy that. I'm looking forward to playing that mode myself. So moving on from questing, which... Pretty simple, now that you know how it works, we're going to talk about challenging. Characters in this game may challenge or attack another character only if that character is exerted. So you, unless some ability tells you otherwise, if a character is just sitting vertically in their ready position, you cannot challenge them. You're going to have to kind of balance between, okay, I want to quest with this character, but now it leaves it open to being challenged or maybe like, my opponent has a character with a really good ability that doesn't require it to exert, so now I'm going to need to find an action card or a spell to take care of that character, or maybe an ability to make it exert, or things like that. So it's a little bit more nuanced than just all my characters attack, like you, the player, and then you would block something like that. This game, it's a lot more straightforward in its own way, but also a little bit more complicated than others. So you'll be questing, you'll be challenging, and the way that the challenge works... Both characters have both a strength and a willpower value. Strength goes into their will, and their will will tick down to zero. Once your character's willpower hits zero or less, the character is banished, which means it goes to your discard pile. Also, in this game, your will is your HP. If a character receives three damage, they keep that three damage. So in an example of Captain Hook versus Donald Duck, Donald has three will and two power, and then Captain Hook has three strength and four will. What will happen here is Captain Hook's three strength will take out all of Donald's willpower. He will be banished in the challenge. But Donald also strikes back, does his two strength to Captain Hook's four will. Now, while Captain Hook is not banished, he does permanently have two damage on him. So now you're going to have to think about, okay, do I want to heal this character with some of my other abilities? Or am I going to leave him damage, which potentially lets one of my opponent's other characters challenge him? And it's also, since you can do things in order, and kind of as much as you want, you can play a character, then challenge, then challenge with somebody else, then quest, then challenge. So you can kind of use a bunch of little guys to take down a big guy if you want to. 
And that's going to be part of the dynamic of combat in this game, which I think is really, really cool. While not directly in the rules, there is one ability that I wanted to go over because it's not very self-explanatory when you read it. So characters like Aurora, a Stitch, and Hades, as we see here, have an ability called Shift. So what Shift does on Hades, the King of Olympus, is instead of playing Hades for his usual 8 ink cost, you can play him, as the card states, for 6. But you have to place him on top of another Hades. So the interesting thing about this, and the thing that makes this ability so good, which is something the community was wondering for a long time, is how does it work in regards to it being played over another character? Does that other character matter? And we found out that, yes, it does. Any damage that's on the smaller Hades will carry over to Hades, King of Olympus, when you shift over it. But likewise, if Hades was able to quest that turn, now the King of Olympus may quest as well. And for Hades in particular, that's a super powerful ability because Hades gains extra lore for every villain you have in play, and the lower cost Hades puts a character from the discard back into your hand, so you may be able to be kind of aggressive with some lower cost villains, such as Maleficent, who has two lore pips for one cost, which is so far very, very strong, and then have your opponent clear that Maleficent out and say, okay... I'm going to bring her back with Hades. After you've done that, play your characters out once more. You can slam Hades, King of Olympus, for six, turn him sideways, gain all that extra lore, and maybe close out the game in a way that your opponent didn't expect and can't really answer. So Shift is really interesting in that regard where you're basically evolving your characters up. And they did specify that it's considered playing the character. So... Anything that will reduce the cost of playing a character or affects playing a character in some type of way also relates to shift. It's just an alternate cost to play the larger character, and it also is basically just changing your previously played character into that new one. Also, another important distinction that we got about shift is that stack of two cards are considered one and they will move as one. So if they, your Hades King of Olympus in this scenario gets banished in a challenge, both Hades go to your discard pile. If they're returned to your hand, likewise, both Hades will return to your hand. And most importantly, if they're sent into your inkwell from a very powerful song, Let It Go, both of them go into your inkwell, where they then split and become two separate inks, which takes a very, very strong removal card. As of yet, there is no way to recover a card from your inkwell into two extra ink, which could be very, very bad for you. <laughs> so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. I think it was a really, really cool feature as well. And now that we know how that works, that was basically the biggest mystery of the game that we couldn't figure out, and now everything's kind of wrapped up in a nice little bow. And that about wraps it up for how to play Lorcana and a little bit of a look into some of the abilities that the game has. I hope you guys are just as excited about this game as I am. I cannot wait for this game to come out, get my hands on some real cards, open some starter decks, and start playtesting and building and heading over to my local game store and playing in hopefully some tournaments or maybe just for fun. Well, that's everything for now. This has been Matrix Sean giving you the lowdown on how to play Lorcana. If you liked it, please feel free to leave a like. Don't forget to comment below. Let me know if you're excited to play this game. If you have any other questions about rulings or anything else the game has to offer, leave them below. I'll try to answer them as best as I can. And if you don't want to miss our future Lorcana videos, don't forget to hit that notification bell and click subscribe. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. Bye.